Jimmy Peterson has never seen the Missouri River. He lives 400 miles from its banks. Yet, what happens to the river happens to Jimmy Peterson, for he is a future citizen of one of the 10 states which make up the Missouri River Basin. The Missouri is the longest river in the United States. There's over 2,400 miles of it, draining a half billion square miles, an area about as big as continental Europe. That belt, 600 miles wide, stretches from Cutbank, Montana, to St. Louis, where the Missouri joins the Mississippi as it flows toward New Orleans and the Gulf. Few economic assets are more valuable than a well-behaved river. But in the past, the Missouri was as often a liability as an asset. It changed channels and rearranged real estate at will. It carried so much topsoil downstream that pioneers said, well, it's too thick to drink and too thin to plow. For years on end, the river might shrink to one third of its maximum flow. And then one year, 30 or 40 million acre feet of water would pour down river, adding another tally to the billions of dollars floods have cost farms, homes, municipalities, and industry. Today, such destructive floods are a thing of the past. The Missouri has been tamed by the greatest system of man-made reservoirs in the world. General Harry G. Woodbury, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, tells how the Missouri was tamed. We began to make the Missouri a servant of the basin rather than its master back in the 1930s with the construction of Fort Peck Dam in Montana. In 1944, the United States Congress authorized the now famous Pick Sloan Plan and full development of the river's resources began. First, there is Garrison Dam above Bismarck, North Dakota, and then Owyhee near Pierce, South Dakota, Big Bend, Fort Randall, and finally Gavin's Point near Yankton. More than 100 smaller dams are authorized on the tributaries. Some of these are complete, others have not yet been started. The main stem dams can store a total of more than 76 million acre feet of water. More than three years, the total annual average flow of the river at Sioux City. The Missouri Basin Program is multi-purpose in nature. Taken all together, its various features benefit everyone. The dams, main stem and tributary, the water storage, the bank stabilization structures and navigation channel yield tremendous dividends in flood control, water transportation, irrigation, electric power, and recreation. It's a truly balanced program. Actually, in its Missouri Basin legislation, Congress created a new concept. Previously, river development had been undertaken only for navigation and flood control. Now, for the first time, a river was to be developed to its fullest potential, not for one or two purposes, but for the benefit of all the residents of the Missouri Basin. No use of the river was to interfere, according to the act, with the beneficial consumptive use of upstream waters for domestic, municipal, stock water, irrigation, mining, or industrial purposes. But fortunately, the potential of the Missouri is so great that there is no real long-term conflict among any of its authorized uses. The needs of navigation, for instance, influence power production by less than 1%. Even before the river development program is finished, it is paying handsome dividends to all who live within its 10-state basin. Later on, we will see the tremendous implications of the river development for the future of Jimmy Peterson and all our boys and girls. But even now, Except for a few tributary valleys, scenes like this are part of a dim, hardly remembered past. Great levees and flood walls keep the river in its place, protecting our farms and crops and our towns and cities. Its flood-free banks, as we shall see, are inviting new industries. The river is no longer a menace to be feared. Now its broad and peaceful reaches are a common treasure of all the inhabitants of the great river basin. Nearly a half million acres of farmland are irrigated, and the project calls for much more irrigation, 
to permit diversification of upriver agriculture. Perhaps the most personal results of the river development program, to a great number of people, are the new recreational opportunities which have been brought into being. Main stem dams have created a water surface of more than a million acres with some 6,000 miles of shoreline. A landlock and water sports have become possible and popular in areas previously deprived of these growing national pastimes. Picnic grounds, campsites, beaches are open to the public without charge, not only at the great dams, but also at many downstream tributary reservoirs and on the lower river itself. But important and indispensable as all these benefits are, they may well be eclipsed in sheer economic value to the people of the basin by another river development benefit, navigation. It's a very great pleasure for me to be here today uh, at uh, Wayne City Landing, where the boats from the only transportation we had in those days, the Missouri River, landed and where all the great trails started, right here. They'd get off the boats here, go up to Independence, have themselves equipped, and then go west to Gardner, Kansas. One trail went southwest to Santa Fe. The 33rd the president, a native of the Missouri River Basin, Harry S. Truman, reminisces City, about the river in his grandfather's day, and then continues. Yes. I was raised out here in southern Jackson County, about 17 miles southwest of Independence. They say it's 10, but it's 17. At any rate, I've measured it time and again, mm -hmm. so I know. And uh, I am very much interested in what you're trying to do. Thank you. I, I think it's a wonderful thing for you to revive the transportation system of the country. You know, this river, the Mississippi River, the Ohio River, were the only lines of transportation to the west in the days I've been talking to you about. Now we've got railroads, road transportation, and now we're bringing them all back, and it's going to take all of them to make this country great. It's going to take all of them to make this country great. Presidents Truman and Eisenhower supported the Missouri Basin Development Program in its original construction stages. And Presidents Kennedy and Johnson have continued that support because it is vital to our section of the country and to the nation. Each method of transportation has its own special advantages. But there are many areas where various means of transportation can, do, and should compete. Mr. Fred Seaton, newspaper publisher of Hastings, Nebraska, for eight years Secretary of the Interior under President Dwight Eisenhower. Now it seems to me that President Eisenhower put it very well when he said, if we are to continue to advance agriculturally and industrially, we must make the best use of every drop of water which falls upon our soil. Toward that end, the Missouri Basin Project serves a highly important purpose. It will help build up our whole region, and it will help add to its diversification and to its prosperity. No matter where he lives in the Missouri Basin, every resident of the region will eventually benefit from that now and in the potentially enriched future which lies before us. Railroad locomotives move about one ton per horsepower. A towboat can move four tons of cargo for each horsepower it develops. That is the reason why modern water transportation is an inherently low-cost way to move bulk commodities. Traffic analysts conclude that cargo can be moved by water for one-third the cost of rail shipment and one-thirteenth the cost of trucking it over the highways. This fact has already made a deep impact on the economy of our whole region. Mr. Robert Woodworth, for many years a top executive of one of the world's largest grain companies, points out some advantages to farmers of water transportation. First, water transportation rates are cheap. The rates are purely and simply lower, and improvements keep making the rates lower still. Beside the lower shipping rates, barge transportation offers money-saving fringe benefits. For one thing, 
We can load a barge in two and a half hours. Time is money. Through competition, cheap water transportation can put an extra five or ten cents a bushel into a farmer's pockets. In fact, it is economical to truck grain from as far as eastern Colorado to the river and ship it by barge. With low-cost water transportation, Missouri Basin farmers can reach a vast grain market that hardly existed for them before the river development was begun. I'm referring to the international grain market, of course. Today, we ship millions of bushels of Missouri Basin grain down to New Orleans and other ports. Lower shipping costs on the river let us compete on the world market. Grain goes down the river, and on the return trip, the barges haul iron and steel for local farm machinery manufacturers, tin plate for local canneries, heavy machinery and electrical equipment, molasses for cattle feed, gasoline and oil, newsprint, cement, literally dozens of commodities needed by the basin's industries and people. Mr. Woodworth makes a vital point. It's no accident that the rate for shipping molasses for cattle feed from New Orleans into the Missouri River area has gone down 25% in the last few years. And you'll see a great many more benefits of this competition as river development continues and as river transportation builds up steam. Transportation on the Missouri is in its infancy, although it's a lusty infant. At present, a single towboat can't handle more than four barges as a rule. When the nine-foot channel authorized by Congress in 1945 becomes a reality, tows of six, eight, even ten barges will be common, as they are today on the Mississippi and other inland waterways. Mr. Truman would like to see a nine-foot channel, and he has another idea. Well, what I would like to do is have the channel nine feet all the way as far up as it can go, and that's a good thing. If I could make it 34 feet, I wouldn't, then I'd bring the battleship Missouri <laughs> yes, up here and park it yes, right sir. here. <laughs> Mr. John B. Gage is one of Kansas City's most distinguished civic leaders. As mayor of his city, he was one of the original supporters of the Pick Sloan plan. Already, most of the lands along the main stem of the Missouri are free from floods. The remaining projects, primarily along the tributaries like the Kansas River, will be completed in the foreseeable future. But we must never relax our vigilance until the entire basin is forever freed from the specter of devastating and life-taking floods. Combined with flood protection, the navigation project will open a whole new vista of industrial growth. We will have many new stretches of flood-free riverfront land available for industrial expansion. When the nine-foot channel is completed, these areas in the entire Missouri Basin will become even more valuable because rates for barge shipment will be drastically reduced. If Jimmy Peterson were to take a trip on the Missouri, the river which will mean so much to his future, he would find that communities along the river from Yankton, South Dakota to St. Louis are building riverside facilities with great rapidity. Sioux City is entering a new era and is building for it, the age of efficient, inexpensive water transportation in a nine-foot channel all the way to the river's mouth. In Omaha and Council Bluffs, this installation for unloading salt is typical of new facilities. For example, at the Omaha Municipal Dock, the economy of mechanized materials handling further reduces the inherent low cost of water movement of bulk cargo. More than a half hundred docks already dot the river's banks. With its new municipal dock, Nebraska City, a pioneer river town, has again turned to the Missouri for future growth. The river's major alfalfa loading facility is located here. Atchison is prepared to share in the river's benefits with a major grain loading facility. Leavenworth is the home of the Missouri's only shipbuilding yard, with extensive facilities for both building and repairing riverboats and barges. As you can see, it's equipped to handle sizable jobs. Port installations have been constructed for handling oil well pipe, typical of the new specialized installations being constructed, such as is this facility, where flour is pumped like a fluid into waiting barges. In the Kansas City area, 
The banks of the river are studded with installations which handle and transship all manner of river cargo. And between Kansas City and the Mississippi are many more docks. In fact, all the way from St. Louis here, a few miles below the mouth of the Missouri, upriver to Kansas City, to Omaha, to Sioux City. And these installations are just the precursors of the large and numerous facilities which will spring up as the channel is improved and industry and agriculture take full advantage of our great waterway. As General Woodbury puts it, now that the nine-foot navigation channel is nearing completion, we can look forward to a steady increase in commercial and industrial development. This will be greatly encouraged by the continued construction of river terminals and other facilities using the newly developed resources of the river and its flood-protected valley. Until the nine-foot channel is in operation, barges cannot be fully loaded because they would draw too much water. A general cargo barge, which transports dry bulk commodities, is presently loaded to draw about six feet of water, which means 900 tons, enough to fill 15 railroad boxcars. When the channel is complete, each barge will hold 1,500 tons, the equivalent of 25 boxcars. A combination barge has tanks for liquid cargo, such as chemicals or molasses, with compartments for dry cargo, too. There has been a dynamic increase in the number of barges and in the cargo carried by water each year, an increase from 153,000 tons to nearly 3 million tons in a 10-year period. Says Mr. Woodworth. Facing this competition, the railroads have rolled up their sleeves. They want their share of the business and they're out to get it. Which means that they're going to have to compete in costs and services to the farmer and his suppliers. One form of competition is the cattle barge, which substitutes a gentle cruise on the river for the jolts of cattle cars being coupled. No long waits for feed and water either. In fact, these cattle continue to gain weight on their floating feedlot. Modern towboats are compact packages of horsepower, usually 3,200 horsepower, although a few are three times that powerful. They are in constant touch with their offices through radio telephone, and radar keeps them moving safely in darkness and bad weather. No longer do tows have to tie up because the human eye cannot see far enough ahead. Engines and rudders have automatic controls. These engines are capable of pushing upstream at three or four miles an hour, enough cargo to make up two 100-car freight trains. Downstream, 10 miles per hour is the usual speed. By unanimous agreement of the crew, this is the most important man aboard the boat. For a month or more at a time, crew members may set foot on land only briefly and at rare intervals. So their comfort aboard the tow is a matter of prime concern. If you've never eaten a meal from a towboat galley, don't ever turn down an invitation, if you're lucky enough to get one. The policy is fine food and lots of it. The tow is constructed and equipped to run 24 hours a day, every day. Its tool room and repair shop is equipped to cope with almost any mechanical emergency and get the tow moving again to its destination. The captain of a Missouri River towboat is highly skilled. He controls the massive power at his disposal with an incredibly delicate touch, maneuvering thousands of tons in a tow longer than a city block with paper-thin accuracy. Barges are pushed rather than towed to increase this control factor. What will become of Jimmy? This is a question that haunts our region. That is the voice of Joe Foss, one of the great heroes of World War II who went on to become governor of his native state of South Dakota and is now commissioner of the American Football League. One of the most hopeful uh, factors in Jimmy Peterson's future and in the future of uh, so many of the children in the Midlands is the Missouri Basin. Uh, the development program, we have yet to develop the full potential of all of these benefits and we've barely started on the development of irrigation. Through irrigation, the upper basin states can contribute notably to the economic growth and strength of the area and the nation. Uh, let me make this clear. Here in the Missouri Basin, we have many attractions for industry. 
Our uh, labor force is the envy of the nation. We have excellent areas for industrial development. We have rich surface and underground water supplies, solvent and responsible state and local governments, and reasonable taxes. But one of the keys of industrial development is today what it has always been, transportation. Transportation today in the Missouri Basin area is largely directed east or west. This is natural since our area was settled from east to west to a large extent. It serves us well, but it does limit our access to markets in the south and the southeast. And we know that regardless of whether or not we are on the main line or even close to a navigation channel, we can benefit from a low cost, com competitive transportation system servicing on all directions. The people of the Missouri Basin have found a new path to the markets of the world. Down in New Orleans, ships come from places far and near, familiar and unfamiliar, to carry on the trade that unites the nations of the world. This great port is but one of many available to us now that the Missouri is part of the 24,000 mile inland waterway system. And our new pathway to the world incomplete as it is, is already an important part of our region's economy. Here in the Missouri Basin, we grow many kinds of grains and raise an important share of the nation's supplies of hogs, cattle, and sheep. We manufacture products of almost every kind and description. Now, because of our distance from the source of many raw supplies and our distance from markets, both agricultural and industrial, we simply must have the most efficient and least expensive transportation system which we can devise. It is here that the barge lines can play an increasingly important part. With all sorts of transportation shipping raw materials in and finished products out, and in some cases competing with each other for that business, I believe that our farmers and cattlemen as well as all the businesses and industries of the whole region will be the beneficiaries. It is in the interest of every Missouri River Basin resident to see the nine-foot channel completed to Sioux City and on to Yankton and into the two Dakotas. With this water lifeline and the continued normal eight-month navigation season, the Missouri River will move up to the big league of water transportation. And the entire nation will benefit. As Abraham Lincoln said when the Illinois-Michigan Canal was opened, and various commodities, including sugar, were transported by water from New Orleans to Buffalo, New York. The New Orleans merchant sold sugar a little more dearly, and the people of Buffalo sweetened their coffee a little more cheaply, a benefit resulting from the canal not to Illinois, where the canal is, but to Louisiana and New York, where it is not. A river navigable by fully loaded barges from the Dakotas to the Gulf. What a difference that will make to the diversity and prosperity of the Missouri Basin and of the nation at large. The good we get from the river is up to us, the citizens of the Missouri River Basin. We must treasure, continue to develop these wonderful natural resources. We must put them all to work to their full capacity. No one will do this job for us. The future of the Missouri Basin is up to us, up to you and to me, who live in this great valley, situated in the very heartland of this great nation. The full promise depends upon the full plan. We must remain committed to all the objectives of the Basin Development Program. We must see that this the largest natural resource development program in the history of mankind meets all the many and diverse interests of the residents of the Missouri Basin. What will become of Jimmy Peterson and the other youngsters growing up in our valley? That is our challenge. We must build our industry, our agriculture. We must create new jobs. We must take steps today to ensure that when Jimmy has grown to manhood, the Missouri Basin will be fulfilling its rich promise, and that in this great valley, there will be, for Jimmy and for all our children, 
new and greater opportunities to lead a full, rich life.